Greetings, Hopkinton. I'm Hank Alessio, hosting this session of Veterans Remember here at HCAM TV Studios on Main Street. We will continue documenting experiences of local people, men and women who served in the U.S. military. They served home and abroad and in every branch of service. Our guests include people who served in peacetime and some during times of conflict. Conflict, I'm sorry. The series of Veterans Remember sessions are one-on-one -on -one conversations with veterans themselves. We will learn how the military influenced their lives and in some instances, how American history was changed while they were serving. The successful programming is for your interest in education and accumulation of all the tape sessions will become an enduring building block of knowledge for those who come after us, that is, our children and grandchildren. Today we're here for a two-part session with a superb guest, a Hopkinton born and bred Marine, Bob Lavoie. Bob, welcome to Re Veterans Remember. Thank you for being with us and being willing to share your story. You're welcome. Um, we have an awful lot to cover today, so we'll get right into it. Bob, help the viewers set the stage. Uh, you were a young boy in Hopkinton before draft age, and the country was being drawn into World War II. What was it like? What were you talking about? What was it in the locker room, around the dinner table? Yeah, there, was, there was talk about places we never heard of before. And we talked about some of our, our troops from Hopkinton that were stationed in some of these places, fellows that were being drafted. We talked a lot about that. We talked about some of the fellows that were injured. We had a lot of serious injuries and casualties from Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were learning as the war went along about the world. The world was get to be pretty small. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you grew out of that uh, young uh, age, and now you're becoming old enough to consider the military yourself. Help us understand how you migrated into the military, into the Marine Corps particularly. Well, I was 15 when the war broke out, and, and then I had to when I turned 17, I, I thought it was my turn to try to do something. I, I had a hard time enlisting because my mother didn't want me to go and she had to sign the, the paper for me to get into the Marines because I was under 18, I couldn't do it on my own. So It might have been easier to go into the military than getting a driver's license at that young age. Yes, it was. It was. <laughs> and from town, where did you end up going when you entered? I went to Paris Island. Mm -hmm. yeah, my first big train ride all the way through all the big cities that I had heard so much about. And I got to, Quanta, to uh, Camp uh, Sandy, uh, Paris Island and uh, started my training. After Paris Island, I, I went to uh, Lejeune, Camp Lejeune in North Carolina for infantry training, BAR training, which I became a BAR and Browning Automatic Rifleman. And uh, I wasn't there too long, a couple of months and they shipped us out again to San Diego. And uh, on the ship, a couple weeks later, and away we went. There were 
needed uh, men badly. We were losing a lot of men in the Pacific. Of course, the war was ending in Europe. Uh, but the Raiders carried on in the Pacific, losing a lot of men over there. Uh, speak for a moment about the, your specialty of being a BAR man. To help help the viewers understand what that meant. Browning automatic rifle is a semi-automatic weapon. It's kind of a heavy weapon. It's 21 pounds with a tripod, but it's automatic fire. It has tw uh, 20 round magazines. It's a magazine fed, unlike a machine gun. And we have, we carried a dozen of those magazines and one in the chamber made 13, 20 rounds. Uh, yeah, we could fire, we had a lot of firepower. Mm -hmm. So that uh, 21 pounds becomes your your f good friend when you're in action. It becomes our best friend. Yeah. It, uh, Talk about 24-7, eh? <laughs> yes, we, we slept with that baby. <laughs> Uh, just as a moment of departure, the time that you were entering the service in 1944, for our viewers' historical context, uh, June of 1944 was D-Day. Later in that year was the Battle of the Bulge. And right after the next year was Iwo Jima. And then the Battle of Okinawa, and then October, uh, I'm sorry, August, the atomic bombs. Well, in that 14-month period, there was probably more American military history underway than you can imagine. And that's when Bob Lavoie was right in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we're, we're in Maui. Get us from Maui to where it was happening? Maui was a training base, and I joined the 4th Marine Division, 24th Marines. Uh, is it, of course, that was the infantry. And we uh, had training after training. Uh, it's, I, I lost track of where I was going. Well, you uh, train there for several months, and most of us think of Maui as a vacation s spot. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your Maui. And from there, you got on that ship and you started, started heading west. So wh what was your Maui like? My Maui was heavy training. Uh, all kinds of hikes, 20 mile hike was nothing, uh, and bivouac uh, maneuvers at night under fire, under artillery fire and so forth. But uh, all kinds of training, regular training, landing, we'd go out in the Higgins boats and tra practice landing from the boats. What in the devil is a Higgins boat? A Higgins boat is a, a landing craft that has a front gate on it, opens up, and uh, we charge, charge out when it comes to the land. So sure. most of us have seen it in the movies. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's real. It's real. Do you remember what unit you were in? You, you you were in the Fourth Marines, but do you remember where else the, the company and the oh, regiment? I was, I was in the Twenty Fourth Marines, Fourth Fourth Division, uh, L Company, Third Battalion, hmm. First Squad. <laughs> wow, you never forget those no, things. No, you eh? don't forget. No. <laughs> so as, as you're now in this boat and you're approaching Iwo, uh, help us understand the activity uh, as you're approaching the beach in the rendezvous activity, in the APA activity? 
Well, the day we landed, of course, we were up early, and uh, the, the galley, as we call it, was wide open to us. We could go down and order, tell the cook what we wanted, whether we wanted steak and eggs, or how we wanted them cooked, which was a rarity. We never did anything like that except for that occasion. But uh, we were off into the uh, landing crafts about 6 o'clock down the rope ladder and cargo net, as we call them. And we get into the Higgins boats and we rendezvoused for hours out around the, the uh, n near the beach, but far enough away so that we were out of immediate danger. And rendezvoused circles went around and waited till the right time. And then they, they'd line up and went, all the Higgins boats would go ashore to the beach and land at the same time. And we, 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 we dispersed from there. It's, and uh, on Evo, it was, uh, it was tough. The, the beach was loaded with all kinds of obstacles when we got there. I wasn't in the first wave, but a few waves ahead of me. And uh, we landed. The first thing I saw was some bodies, dead bodies. And uh, I realized at that point that I was no longer a kid. The whole was. Uh, took on a different meaning. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were on the beach. Any, anything a, happened in the area as you were approaching the beach with the kamikazes overhead and things like that? No, they, they didn't have any kamikazes. They, uh, they hit one of the heavy cruisers, Saratoga cruiser, but that was from shore oh. somehow. They got too close. I mean, we went right by that when we went into land. So then you finally hit the beach uh, as the 4th Division. Uh, you were somewhat away from Suribachi doing your own thing? Yes, we were We were on the, the right-hand side of Suribachi. We were a little further up along the beach. And when we went in, we hit these terraces where were all volcanic ash, very difficult to climb. And there was three of them. And you go up one terrace, and then they had a, a level playing field area that was where they could strafe anybody crossing that pretty much. The Japanese had targeted in pretty well. And we had three of those terraces to climb. And very difficult with the volcanic ash, mm -hmm. trying to get up as. And we went to the right, and we went up the cliffs, the high, high ground, which was very difficult. Um, we didn't do that the first day. I should be getting ahead of myself here, but we were on the beach for that that night. You know, that first night, were you on one of the terraces? Where did you yes, dig in? On the, one of the terraces, mm -hmm. yeah, up near the top. No silk sheets, eh? No, no, mm -hmm. no white sheets. Mm -hmm. We went up to uh, the high ground. It took us a, a couple of days. And when they raised the flag on Sarabachi, we could see it from the high ground where we were looking back. Mm -hmm. And we heard this roar go up from the rear echelon. And right away, we wonder what's going on. Well, it was the flag went up. And then we looked back, we could see the flag. And that was a great feeling. It was the guys 
behind us were firing in the air. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden the flag was gone. They took it down. And when you saw that flag, did you think the battle was over? We, no, no, it was just as, it's, it's an uplifting mm -hmm. feeling that we're here to stay. <laughs> and uh, then the flag came down and they replaced it with another one. Well, we, when it went down, we knew something was wrong, we figured. But it went back up again, and uh, it was quite a sight. Great, great. Uh, one of the things you told me some while ago is that when you were approaching the beach, you were in reserve. And I've always been amazed at the use of the term reserve. You know, I could have been the eighth man in reserve on my high school basketball team. But when you're in the Marine Corps, what is it like to be a reserve well, in battle? Yeah. Well, we were supposed to be a backup company mm -hmm. originally. But when the battle took place, it was all, that was all gone. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to back up another, go where we were, where we were needed most. Mm -hmm. But uh, that never came about. So being a reserve didn't mean any uh, it taking it easy at all. No, no, no. no. Yeah. Plans, the plans were changed drastically because the operation became a lot bigger than they had planned. Mm -hmm. Originally, we were supposed to be only in there for three days operation. But that was a little underestimated. <laughs> What, th that brings up another term. Help us understand when you talk, what does D plus 11 mean or D plus 15 mean? Well, D was disembark day. D, that's the first day that you go ashore. As an example, you go ashore. Then the next day would be D plus 1. That would be the first day. So. And then you count all those days after mm -hmm. that. But D is the first day, actually. So mm -hmm. D plus two would really be the third day. But mm -hmm. that's the way they ran mm -hmm. the numbers. And then when you're on shore, uh, there was a lot of buying and selling of real estate. I mean, you were trying to gain some ground here. And then at night, they were trying to gain it back. Can you give us a little? sensitivity to your real estate problem? Well, it was tough. It was constant exchanging landscape, as you say. But we didn't retreat. We didn't give back any land we got. It was very hard to get footage. There was some days we never moved out of the foxhole. We were pinned down there five days from that Hill 382. They had us boxed right in. Mm -hmm. Too much firepower from the caves. To gain, we gained a few yards at, and uh, we had to worry about the caves behind us as we gained ground because they come out at night. At night was a big problem. We had a lot of problems at night. So you were being fired upon from Hill 382 or from Suribachi? 382. From 382. Yes, Suribachi was taken. That was done. Mm -hmm. So on the beach we had trouble with Suribachi. Mm -hmm. But <coughs> the nights were tough because we were in their backyard and they knew every nook and cranny. Mm -hmm. As we advanced, mm -hmm. the more we advanced, the more the caves were opened up behind us and they had to be destroyed before we could mm -hmm. really feel a little safe. Mm -hmm. And when, when you mention at night, and this has been told me several times, uh, the Navy was helping you out by setting out those flares. They were godsend, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. How did they affect you? 
They were wonderful. <laughs> that was that was great because. <coughs> now here is a marine <laughs> saying that the Navy is wonderful. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh no. No, they were good. They were good to us. And those flares, we did have some flares from our own artillery and so forth, but the Navy destroyers right off the coast, they would send up these five-inch guns, they'd send up these big flares. Mm -hmm. And of course, rainy nights were, didn't help us any, but for the most part, they were great. And the flares were to light up the area and or create shadows that you can see moving. Yes, yes. Some nights, if it was windy, they were they went they didn't last long the flares. Mm. But when they did, they sent down a light. There was enough light that we could see any movement, mm -hmm. and that was that was great because they liked to get out at night and mm. and nocturnal beasts. Huh? Yeah. Mm. Is there anything that might be a little uh, mellower to discuss with the viewers? Anything personal? What, what did you eat? Uh, how did you eat? Uh, did you ever shower? Did you get mail? You know, some of the personal effects of being away from home. Well, on, on the, I was on the front lines for 26 days, and we got mail once. Mm -hmm. they, that was a big morale boost. They get, it was difficult. How, you know, how are they going to come out and say, hey, Milko, no, yeah. Yeah, none of that stuff. We had to sneak back to the compound and, and get a meal and then get back in line, online. The, uh, K rations were, what we had most K rations, mm -hmm. not too encouraging, not too. <laughs> but uh, of course, there was no shower, no nothing. We, a few times we came back off the front lines for supposedly to get a little rest, and their breakthroughs in the lines, we had to go right back up again. So I had very little time behind the lines. Mm -hmm. And uh, shower, you mention shower? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> we had all we could do to mm -hmm. drink our coffee. So once, once you oh. got on land, the high ground, and got into it, were there firefights every day, every night? Every night, mm -hmm. right up to the end. Right up to the end, we get to the far end of the beach. Even that last night, they tried to, a few guys who came out of the cage and they were trying to get to the other end of something, I don't know where, but they were trying to get along the beach to get up to another cave maybe, I don't know. But they didn't make it. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's going all the way back to your, your sailing from Maui or from when you're in the heat of things on land, I'm sure you created personal relationships with the fellows in your outfit. And uh, are there people that you stayed in touch with? Are there stories that you can remember about Jones or Smith or something like that? Well, I I had s several close friends. Uh, one in particular was a cold talker, Indian, from uh, Menominee Reservation of Wisconsin. And uh, he and I became cl quite close. Hmm. Uh, another uh, fellow by the name of Biglow, Walt Biglow, Biglow. He and I went through boot camp together, and we were pretty close. We went to Lejeune together, and we ended up in the same squad hmm. and the same fire team. So he and I were right aside of each other all the time. And uh, 
he got he got killed. Oh dear. It was sad. It was sad because he was sitting in the hole. You talked about mail call. We had some mail. This is about D plus 11, 12. And he was reading a letter from home. And he's sitting in the tears are coming down his eyes. His mother was talking about Easter Sunday. She had no bonnets and clothes, and she explained to him. And he had lost a brother at Dunkirk, was killed. And about a day later, he got it. Oh, dear. He was right aside of me, we were going up a little low. And, uh, yeah. Um, we're we're going to get to a foxhole story you told me once before. But before we do, could you tell us what a code talker is? That's a strange term. Code talker is the Indian language. They could they could speak their own native language, and they called it talking in code because nobody else could understand them. And it was very important that the communications between the different platoons and company and so forth, that no other, no one else could pick it up and figure it figure out what was going on because the code talkers had their own definitions. Kind of like teenagers today. Huh? Kind of like teenagers today. Mm -hmm. As you can see, there's an awful lot of material to cover with Bob Lavoie's experiences, and we've chosen to make it a two-part series, return to part two at HCAM TV. Enjoy. <laughs>